okay, so you're learning a new piece and there's no fingering written in, but you don't know how to choose good fingering. Or maybe there is fingering written in, but it doesn't feel quite right. And so you don't know is the problem with the fingering or is the problem with you? And are you even allowed to change the fingering that's written in? So the answer is yes, you can change it, but you need to consider these 10 rules of fingering I'm gonna show you today. And make sure you stick around to the end because I'm gonna show you how to consider these rules in the context of a piece. Hi, I'm Christy Lynn from Learning the Harp, where we make playing the harp feel simple and doable. So today we're talking about the 10 rules of fingering, and I've actually created a PDF summarizing these 10 rules. So you can click up here to get it free of charge. You can print it out and keep it with you so that when you're deciding on fingering for a new piece, you can refer back to it and it will make your life much easier. I wanna make a quick disclaimer before we get to the 10 rules. So I'm saying these as rules of fingering, but actually there's gonna be some situations where the rules clash with each other, or maybe it's not even logical to use the rules. So when you get to specific situations, you need to weigh up the rules and use them as a guide. Um, so if you find a situation where it doesn't apply, please don't come for me. <laughs> I'm just trying to do my best to give you something solid as a starting point, and then you can work from there. Okay, rule number one, if there's one note, use your second finger. So the second finger is easiest to pluck on its own, unless it's a really low note, in which case it's easier to stretch down with your fourth finger. So sometimes you'd use your fourth finger in your left hand. Rule number two, if there are two notes, use interval patterns. So we're always gonna be using the thumb and one other finger, depending on how far apart the notes are. The thumb gives leverage and the other finger plucks in the opposite direction. So this applies when you're playing two notes at the same time, or when you're playing two notes one after each other. So let's look at what those rules are. So if there's a second or a third or a fourth interval, you're gonna use your second finger. Or if there's a fifth or a sixth interval, you use your third finger. And if there's a seventh interval or wider, you will use your fourth finger. <laughs> you may wonder why you can't use different fingers if it feels more comfortable for you. And there are some reasons behind that. The one is that we're training the muscle memory to do a certain interval when there's two notes on their own, but it actually sets ourselves up for using other fingers if there's a chord or a series of notes. So for example, you may feel comfortable playing an octave with one and three instead of one and four. Maybe if you have big hands or you have narrow string spacing on your harp, but actually if you use fingers one and three for an octave, then when you're trying to play like an arpeggio or a chord like this, you need to be able to use fingers two and three for the in-between notes. So we need to train our hands to always play an octave with one and four so that when we have notes in between, we're already used to using that spacing. And we wanna be consistent with using the same fingers for certain intervals every time because then we're getting quicker with our placing and it becomes more automatic to always use that fingering. Even if you have a small harp with narrow spacing, like a lap harp, and you just feel like it's easier to use a different fingering, I would suggest that you still stick with these fingering rules because if you ever do decide to buy a bigger harp then you don't have to change your whole way of fingering and learn to play pieces with different fingers. <laughs> Rule number three, if there are four notes or less going in one direction the highest note is the thumb and the other fingers and the lowest note is going to just depend on how many fingers you need to complete that series of notes. Rule number four, if there are more than four notes going in one direction think about where to cross. You're going to need to balance the number of crossovers and unders you do with, with which finger feels most comfortable to cross over and under with. For example, if you cross under with the fourth finger, that may feel a little more difficult, but it's gonna take a lot less time and effort than if you're crossing under with the second finger for the same pattern. Rule number five, consider the rule of brackets. The rule of brackets is that we have to place everything within the bracket before we play the first note in the bracket. And also we only bracket things that are going in one direction. So whenever the direction changes, we start a new bracket. For example, if we're gonna play these three notes, C, E, D, we won't place them all in the beginning and then play C, E, D 
because we're not following the rule of brackets where you can only go in one direction. So we would have to place the first two notes using our rule of intervals. So we actually use our second finger and then the next bracket needs to start because now we're moving down and you place your second finger again and then we'll play the thumb and then the second finger. So we end up with this fingering, two, one, two, instead of three, one, two. The reason we start a new bracket every time we change directions is because as soon as you're in automatic mode and maybe you're concentrating on the left hand, you'll find that whatever fingers you've placed in the right hand, when you start going in one direction, you end up continuing going in that direction. So for example, if we had placed our three, two, one, intending to play C, E, D, when we're concentrating on the left hand, maybe we've built up the speed and we don't have so much attention, you're actually gonna end up by mistake playing three, two, one. So it's better to choose fingering that's actually gonna help you when you're in the automatic mode later on. Okay, what do you think so far? Are you finding this video helpful? If so, then please make sure you subscribe to this channel because I'm putting up videos like this all the time and I'd love to see you in the next one and help you along in your journey. And make sure you stick around to the end of the video. I'm still gonna show you how these things apply within a piece. Let's get to number six. Rule number six, when there's a turnaround, include the thumb. Okay, so a turnaround is when you go up and then down again, or when you go down and then up again. So when you're going up and then down again, the thumb is usually the highest note. Or. And when you're going down and then up again, you usually start and end on the thumb, even if that means skipping out a finger. So for example. Or. skipped out the third finger there at the end. Rule number seven is when there's a long note, come off. So how long is a long note? It's gonna depend on the piece and how fast you play it. And you're gonna have to weigh up the pros and cons of coming off more often and having more overlapping brackets. So when you have a lot of overlapping brackets, that's really great because it means that you don't have to look at your hands as often and you can rather spend attention on maybe looking at the left hand or looking at the sheet music. Um, whenever you come off, you have to place again and that means you have to look at your hand. But the pros of coming off on long notes is because it releases tension. It also means that you can pluck harder and get a nice big tone because you're balancing that by releasing the tension. And it also makes it less likely to buzz because you'll come off and then you'll place very confidently and that's much easier than joining the notes and then you're kind of right next door and you're more likely to buzz. Rule number eight is avoid crossing when there's a skip in the notes. So it's much easier to cross over or under when you're crossing to a next door note rather than if you're crossing under when you're skipping one or two strings. Um, so try to make sure that you're crossing when you're playing adjacent strings. Rule number nine is consider what the left hand is doing. So sometimes when you're choosing your fingering for the right hand, you actually wanna have longer series of overlapping brackets because the left hand is jumping all over the place, placing often, and you need to be able to look with your eyes at your left hand. We can't be looking at two places at once. Once you've placed the one hand, you then can play all those notes without looking and that gives you attention to look elsewhere. Rule number 10, consider if it's repeated later on in the piece. Sometimes we're looking at a particular passage and there's a few options of fingering that seem equally good, but then you notice that later on in the piece, there's a very similar passage, but it has some small differences and those differences actually show us that one way of fingering would be way better than the other and you want to make sure that you actually use the same fingering for both parts of the piece because then that's actually helping us to develop the muscle memory and it makes us more automatic with our fingering, makes it easier to memorize and just easier to play. Now let's look at how these rules of fingering apply within a piece. Uh, but before we get to that, just a reminder that you can get your PDF download of the 10 rules of fingering in a nice printout that you can use. So click up there and make sure you get that. And now let's get to the piece. Let's use my arrangement of Sally Gardens as an example. There's free sheet music for this one. And so we're just gonna go through the piece and I'm gonna pick out a few places where you can see the rules of fingering being applied. Let's start in the first measure. We see in the left hand, we have two notes, C and G coming straight after each other. 
So we need to apply rule number two, where if there's two notes, we use interval patterns. And this is a fifth interval, one, two, three, four, five. So we use fingers three and one. Even if you feel comfortable using fingers two and one, you shouldn't do that because with the fifth interval, we use three and one, and that sets our, us up so that if we play a triad any time, then we have the second finger to use in the middle. So a fifth interval, we use three and one. Now let's move on to the right hand in the same measure. We see there are three notes in a row, C, D, E. And so we're gonna refer to rule number three of fingering, where there's four notes or less going in the same direction, the highest note is the thumb. So we would use fingers three, two, one here. And that makes sense, it feels a lot more comfortable than for example, four, three, two. It's so much better to have that leverage of the thumb going in the opposite direction. And now ending off that first measure, we have one single note on its own at the end of the first measure, which is a G in the left hand. So we're gonna refer to rule number one, which is when there's one note on its own, we use the second finger. Now you may ask yourself, why are we playing that G as a single note on its own when we could join it to the bracket that comes straight afterwards in measure two? And I guess then what we would have done if we joined it is we'd play it with the thumb because it's a turnaround. And it just doesn't feel as free and, and easy. Um, there's nothing happening in the right hand at that time, so we don't need to join the bracket to give ourselves the attention for looking at what the right hand is placing. And it just feels quite free and easy to be able to do that. And it's good to be able to place quickly. So there, I think it's good to just have that G on its own. Now let's skip ahead to measure number six. The second half of measure number six in the right hand has this little passage with a whole series of overlapping brackets. I'm, not, I'm gonna ignore that first note, I'm just gonna look at the second part where it's a turnaround. So the question is, why didn't we finger that one, three, two? And the reason is because of rule number six. When there's a turnaround, include the thumb on both sides. So we don't do one, three, two. We do one, two, one. And you can try it out for yourself and you'll feel that it actually feels more secure. Now let's move back just a little bit before what we were talking about in measure six. Um, and that is at the end of measure five, we had this long note. And then we led into this part with the turnaround. So why did we come off after that A? And that is because we're referring to rule number seven on long notes come off. So it actually feels good to float off there. You have the time to place again. It also allows those notes to sing out more. If we join all of it together, we're kind of dampening the strings more as opposed to, it just allows everything to sing. And then if we're talking about coming off on long notes, a lot of times in this piece, we're actually coming off after quarter notes. So why didn't we come off after the quarter note in measure six? I could have come off and then placed again. And the reason is because we're referring to rule number nine, consider what the left hand is doing. So if I play this, section of the piece, you'll see that it's useful to have overlapping brackets here so that I can look at the left hand placing. So over here, I'm able to look at my left hand and place down there without having to look at my right hand because I can do this without looking. If I came off, I'd have to look at the right hand, the left hand, the right hand. So look here. There's just a lot of coming off and placing and it feels more secure to have a slightly longer overlapping bracket there. Let's move on to measure 13. So we have this little passage where I've put two overlapping brackets. The question is, why didn't I place one, two and three and then do because it's kind of easier to just place the thumb here as opposed to placing one and three and then placing two and one. And the reason is because we're referring to rule number five, which is consider the rule of brackets. 
we have to go in only one direction after we've placed the fingers down. We don't want to play one, three, two, because then when we're focusing on the left hand and we're reading the music and everything's becoming more automatic, you would probably find yourself playing and then, oh no, it's wrong. <laughs> so rather just place one and three and then have your second bracket so that you're always going in one direction and then in the other direction with a separate bracket. Now let's move on to measure 21 and measure 22. And this is actually an example of a mistake that I made. So if you had already downloaded the sheet music of Sally Gardens, remember it's a free one. So some of you will have this already and you may have noticed that I made a mistake. Um, measure 21 and 22 has this same thing that happened earlier on in the piece, but I used different fingering. So I did not obey rule number 10. Consider if it's repeated later in the piece. I think what happened is when I was choosing fingering for this piece, I changed my mind a few times and I forgot to check that it's all the same whenever there's a repeated pattern. So we have this, um, And that happened in the beginning of the piece. I did the fingering three, two, one as a bracket and then two, one. But when I wrote it here in measure 21 and 22, I did three, two, one, two, one with an overlapping bracket. And so there's a discrepancy here. And so if you bought the sheet music before I made this change, here's a little example. You need to go and make sure that you've got it written in exactly the same with the same bracketing so that you're practicing the muscle memory and you're becoming automatic with one way of doing things whenever it happens within the piece. I was wondering if you'd like me to make a video where I take a piece that has no fingering written in and on camera I weigh up all the rules of fingering and finally choose good fingering for that piece right in front of you. Would you like me to make a video like that? Let me know down in the comments. And if you enjoyed the Sally Gardens sheet music in today's video, you can get it free of charge. There's a video here where I will show you how to play it. I'll see you there.